Welcome to another episode of Enough Talk, where we get real about what's going on in California and beyond. It's unfettered, unfiltered, and it's about time someone said it. I'm here today with my guest, Glendale Council Member Ara Najarian. Ara, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Alex. Of course. Uh, so let's start, Ara. What have you had enough of? Alex, I've had enough of injustice at Glendale City Hall. And there's a lot behind that. Uh, and it mainly involves me. And it mm -hmm. mainly involves what occurred in the past two weeks. Okay. Let's, let's go in head first. So there are people who know about what happened and are very upset about it. And there are people who have just been completely oblivious about it. So why don't you catch that segment of the population up to speed? Okay. Let's, let's start, Alex, with a little bit of background. Mm. And the background is very important because it sets the stage and explains how we got to where we are right. here in Glendale. So Glendale uh, is a chartered city, and we elect our mayor once a year on the first Tuesday in April from among the five city council members. There is no separate election to be mayor. So you get elected to council, and then every April, there's a selection made as to who is going to be mayor. And so the council members, they are elected for four-year terms, correct? Yes, four-year um, terms. And are they all elected at the same time, or is it staggered for the five? Uh, there is a stagger. Mm -hmm. So uh, three council members uh, are elected uh, one year, and then two years later, the other two council members are elected. All of them serve a four-year term. Okay. So we used to have a unwritten policy where uh, the council members amongst themselves would decide who would be mayor for any uh, coming year. It was, not directly, it was not directly elected by the people. Correct. And it Glend was just among those five council members. So Glendale has never directly elected the mayor. They elect the five city council members who amongst themselves choose. Exactly. Okay. And uh, each year, uh, sometimes it would go smoothly. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it would be a little rocky. There was an unspoken rule, an unwritten rule, actually, that the person who had been on council and had been on council the longest since last being mayor mm -hmm. would be the mayor. And you've been mayor before? I have been mayor four times. Okay. And I was first elected to city council in 2005. Okay. So it's not like I was elected eight years ago and I packed four mayor terms in that. Mm -hmm. No. Uh, on average, it would come about every four years. Okay. And that would depend on if there's new council members coming in, other council members dropping off. Now, that mayor selection process uh, wouldn't always be uh, easy. There would be a lot of backdoor dealing. Some members on the city council definitely wanted to be mayor as many times as possible mm -hmm. and would go speak to other council members and either make promises, make deals, make threats against them, uh, donate money to their campaigns, etc., to be mayor. Okay. On any one year, it was oftentimes very uncertain as to who would be mayor up until the very last minute. A lot of drama that didn't need to be uh, dramatized. Okay. There were a couple instances when deserving mayors, deserving meaning it was their turn to be mayor, okay. were passed over by the council. Mm -hmm. uh, most recently, uh, in 2016, okay. when Laura Friedman was supposed to be mayor, uh, during that year, she was in an assembly race mm -hmm. with Artie Kasakian. Now, she had already been mayor previously. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. She had been mayor once before. Uh, and I think 2009 or 10, if, it was, if I'm not mistaken. I, I believe so. So, so. It, it had been a, f a fair number of years yes. since she'd been mayor again. Okay. And then so as via this unspoken rule right. where she'd been on and had been a while, so her, it, her turn would come up. Yes. Okay. So she had an election coming up that year in June. And the mayor selection is in April. Okay. Running against her in the assembly race was Artie Kasakian. Mm -hmm. Artie Kasakian's supporters and supporters and advocates for the ANC, mm -hmm. Glendale, came to me 
and said, you're not going to elect Ellen to be mayor. Now, just so I understand correctly, at that time, Artie Kasakian was the city clerk. Yes, he was the city clerk. And so El- I'm, Laura Friedman was council member. Yes. But then if she was elected mayor, she kind of would have had this extra feather in her cap going into an election against somebody who is, quote, just the city clerk. Absolutely. Understood. She would carry the title of mayor, mm-hmm. at least for the last two months prior to the election. Okay. And um, I think that the Kasakian team and the ANC team thought that would be uh, too much for her uh, unfair, unfair or advantage. an advantage okay. uh, over Artie. And the word came out, if you vote for Laura to be mayor. Because you were one of the council members at the time. I, I was one. Okay. That we're going to not support you in any future elections. The vote came down mm-hmm. and we passed over Laura Friedman to be mayor. We selected Paula Devine. Paula Devine. What was the what was the vote count of the five people? Was it three against two, four against one? It was one? four to one. Four to one. Okay. It was four to one. I think Laura voted for herself. Okay. I wasn't happy with that. That really was an unfair move. Mm-hmm. I think I was swayed. I blinked in the face of uh, pressure from the Kasakian group and the ANC group. In any event, uh, Devine became mayor. Okay. We would continue year after year. There were times when someone felt, you know, they should be mayor, but when we looked at the rule, at our unspoken rule, it uh-huh. said, no, uh, you shouldn't be the mayor, it should be this other person. Because you haven't been there a sufficient length of time yet, this other person has kind of been there exactly. waiting their turn, so to speak. And Paula Devine, when she got chosen mayor over uh, Laura Friedman, who had been there longer, had Paula been mayor, uh, Paul been mayor before? Paula, I do not believe, had been mayor before. Okay. So Laura had been mayor before, um, but it was kind of her turn coming yes. through. But again, this, as you said, no consistent rule. It was just whatever at, at the time was being done or um, yes, arranged exactly. for. Okay. So let's fast forward. Uh, we uh, were now into the year 2021. 20, uh, mm-hmm. And uh, on the council, we have Varej Agajanian. Artie. Okay. Artie puts on the agenda uh, an item which would make it a law Mm -hmm. for the unwritten, previously unwritten policy as to who becomes mayor. Okay. And that said, as we've mentioned several times. so So he's trying to close the loophole that he was taking advantage of in the past. Uh,. Indirectly, he, yeah. he took he took advantage of it indirectly, right? Because he, he was the beneficiary of yes. it, and so but the unwritten rule which not followed allowed Laura Friedman to be skipped over, yes, which would not give her the unfair advantage. So he would be the benefactor yes. of that move. Okay, precisely. But he, and he wanted to close that loophole. He wanted to close it, and we all discussed it, and we all used the same terms. We wanted to be certain. Mm-hmm. We wanted to be fair. Transparent. Transparent, reliable, predictable. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we went down and we set several rules that the longest person on council since last mayor, uh, if there's two people like that, then we look to see at the last election who got the most votes. A tiebreaker, so to speak. Right. And uh-huh. if there was another a tiebreaker needed, it would be the council's decision okay. as to which one of those two would go. And we all said the same thing. And it was a unanimous Vote, five zero. Uh-huh. That this is the way we should do it. So four out of the five voting people who are currently on city council, right? So yes. Paula Devine, Dan Brotman, you, and Artie Kasaki. Yes. So eighty percent of the council was identical. Absolutely. Back then, and so a unanimous vote it was passed. Right. Okay. Now, unbeknownst to us, and perhaps to our oversight, uh-huh. the city attorney had put a little zinger, an escape clause okay. in that ordinance, in that law that said, despite identifying who is going to be the mayor, mm-hmm. and by the way, the language was mandatory. This person shall be the mayor. mayor. And shall is a strong word mm-hmm. when you're talking about ordinances and laws. It's mandatory. Right. It's obligatory. You have no discretion to veer from that. Mm -hmm. But the city attorney put in this paragraph that said, well, despite all of these 
these very uh, detailed uh, rules as to who would be the mayor, if you think that this person is not in the best interests of the city due to, for example, criminal conviction, mental or physical incapacity, uh -huh. the council, among other things, among other things. Somebody, uh, okay, so being like John Draymond, for example, being convicted of a crime that would prevent you from, that would be that clause, like this person should not be mayor. That would be an objective finding that, that was specifically stated in that little escape. And hatch. you said if you have any sort of mental illness, but being a narcissist doesn't qualify no, as mental illness. Doesn't, okay, doesn't understood, that, understood. That okay. incapacity okay. issue. <laughs> um, that part was, was thrown in. Oh. Um, and we didn't uh, get an explanation at the time from the city attorney. Okay. City attorney didn't warn us and say, hey, we've got this thing called the best interests. Uh -huh. uh, he's the one who drafted it. And we had no idea that we were voting for it. He never brought it to our attention. I, from, from, a lay, from a layperson standpoint, right? You're an attorney. I'm not an attorney. From a layperson standpoint, that sounds like an acceptable clause to put in there because – you know, things may happen, right? And so if, if somebody's in line and yes, the, somebody's a convicted criminal, somebody is, you know, not taking their medications for their bipolar disorder yet, and, and you definitely truly need to bypass them. From a layperson standpoint, that seems like a reasonable clause to put in. Objective. Objective, Except yes. when you get to the best interests, mm. not in the best interests clause. That's the part that's real squishy. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows what it means. And unfortunately, council voted on it. Mm -hmm. um, before well, we selected our mayor, uh -huh. uh, we raised, uh, we had a discussion on council about ways to fix the mayor selection law. Mm -hmm. One of the items that I brought up was, we need to fix this best interests. How long ago was that? Was that recently? This was approximately uh, a month ago. A month ago, okay. Right. And I asked my colleagues, hey, first I chastised the city attorney uh -huh. for slipping it in there. Okay. I chastised them, not just slipping it in there, but for uh, uh, drafting it in such a vague and ambiguous manner. And I chastised them for not bringing it to our attention and explaining to us mm -hmm. what, what that means. Let, let, let me ask you this question. So in 2021, where it was, when it was that drafted... Who was the next mayor according to those rules? Who became the next mayor? The next mayor was uh, Paula Devine. Paula Devine, okay. She used that selection process okay. without a hiccup. Okay, and then at, so that was in 2021. Right. And then in 2022, who Artie was mayor? Artie Kasakian. Artie Kasakian, the one who brought the law in the first right. place. Without a hiccup, without a bat of an eye. Okay. Everyone knew he was going to be mayor, no problem. So conveniently enough, two years after he drafted the law, he got to be mayor. His turn came yes. up, conveniently enough. Okay. And then and Dan Brotman followed him. Dan Brotman, okay. And then who was up next after Dan Brotman? Who's on the on-deck circle? After Dan Brotman was me. You, Okay. Um, so why, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Why did council see fit even to address the law, the, the rules again, the law again? Well, um, what, so what happened was, uh, Ellen, a Saturian mm. who was elected first in 2022, uh, said that the law was unfair is this before or after she decided to abandon us by running for assembly? This was after. Oh, because her, her bid failed, did it not? Her bid failed. In okay. fact, as soon as she got elected to council in 2022, a few months later, she was announcing that she was running for assembly. So after she got into a relationship with us, she was also already looking for the next best thing after yes. a few months. Yes, she was. Okay. Um, and... She was uh, perhaps thinking that if I can be mayor mm -hmm. going into this election in 2024. Because her opponent, Nick Schultz, was mayor. Was mayor is currently is mayor. is mayor at the time, yes. She wanted to have that boost, that so, benefit. Because she thought that Nick Schultz would have the unfair advantage against her. Right. Understood. Um, she threw in some other reasons. Okay. Saying it was unfair to women. Mm. It was unfair to young women. How does she define a woman, though? She does not define a woman. She cannot define a woman. She failed that test. She did. Um, 
she didn't even take that test. Yeah. I mean, she had no answers. There was a, another local podcast uh-huh. that asked her that, and she was, I mean, it's as though she was being asked the uh, to explain the concept of relativity, <laughs> you know, Einstein's theory. She was she was blanked out. For for those people at home, uh, to define a woman, a woman is an adult human female. Back to you, Ara. Thank you. <laughs> um, so the I started to sense that these three colleagues of mine were interested in invoking that best interest uh, exclusion clause against me. So the three people being Artie Kasakian, Ellen Asaturian, and Dan Brotman. Dan Brotman. Was, Ellen's excuse was, I never voted for that law. I don't have to follow it. Mm. So folks, uh, don't teach that to your kids. If your kids don't vote for a law, if they're, you know, even if they're lay, lay people, uh, that does not give them the right to violate the law. So that's a bogus, immature, illogical explanation that Ellen gave for pursuing the mayorship. Almost sounds like what a dictator would do and say, I didn't write the constitution for this country. I don't have to play by those rules. I'm going to seize power. Yes. Because I'm a narcissist. Yes. Okay. <laughs> she got Artie Kasakian on her side. Mm-hmm. Artie was not happy because I had endorsed two other candidates for city council mm-hmm. uh, beside, uh, instead of him. Yep. Uh, James Clark mm-hmm. and Vera Jagajania. Okay. That really irked him. Uh, Dan Brotman was, uh, so Dan Brotman was holding against me an interview I did mm-hmm. in June, almost uh, 10 months ago, uh, that I gave to a, uh, uh, a show, I guess it's a TV segment called California insider yep. in which I tried to explain the reasons for the fights at the Glendale Unified School District back in June. Uh-huh. And he uh, he mistakenly believes that I'm asserting everything in that interview as fact. Mm-hmm. When in reality, the question posed to me was, why did this fight begin? And Got I it. said, this fight began because parents were realizing uh-huh that their children were being taught improper sex education, um, assisting them with gender-affirming care, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The interview went on for many more minutes after that, Uh but they became upset, they meaning Dan and the uh, LGBTQ activists and the teachers' union and the school board uh, became angry that I would address that issue outside of an official setting, Um. on my own private time, uh, exercising my own First Amendment rights, not calling for a riot to be held uh, at the foot, at the steps of the Capitol, not calling for any violence to be perpetrated, Mm -hmm. but they needed to find a bad guy. So, so 10 months later, actually, since it's broadcast, seven months later, Uh Dan Brotman pulls that out on me and says, oh, well, this is what you did, and you caused violence in our community, and I and I don't think you're in the best interests of the city. And you were not in the best best interests of the city because you were anti-gay. That is, that's how they tried to turn it. Yes. And one of your two candidates that you endorsed for city council, James Clark, would be gay. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. And uh, you endorsed also a gay candidate in the race for Congress to replace Adam Schiff. Would that be a correct statement? That would be you, Alex. Yes. Yes. So how anti-gay of you, Ara, how shamelessly anti-gay of you to endorse two quality candidates who happen to be gay? Well, you see, when they get the playbook, Mm. uh, the playbook doesn't cover every, every situation that might occur. So if you disagree with someone... Uh, on an issue, uh, in this case of sex education, playbook says label them as anti-gay, homophobe, mm. uh, et cetera, et fascist. cetera, fascist, uh, white supremacist. Uh, the playbook failed them in that in that regard. So what happened was it was time for the vote. Mm. Without getting too deep into the rules and laws, but um, we mm. all learned this in 
in grade school in civics class. It's the Fifth Amendment to our U.S. Constitution mm -hmm. and the Fourteenth Amendment that applies that to the states. And it says that there shall be no taking of uh, liberty or property without due process of law. So I was prepared to present my case to the council on that evening. Uh, I had brought an attorney with me. Yep. I had given a legal brief to the uh, city attorney because what they're doing is they're voting to say, I, they're putting me on trial. Yep. Is Ara guilty of not being in the best interests of the city? And you, correct me if I'm wrong, had the city council at a prior meeting tried to specify what not serving in the best interests is? Well, as I said, they admitted that that uh, they all admitted they had no idea what that term and phrase in the law meant, and they all agreed that we have to change this and we have to specify what this means. It's too vague. It's too ambiguous. So the week prior to the vote, it was raised to the council members, what does that mean, not being in the best interest, and was anybody able to define it? Nobody was able to define no. it. Not even the city attorney who wrote it and slipped it in the in the uh, rule in the ordinance. And so then, what the city council said is, let's try to define this further. And if we cannot define this further, let's take it out entirely. But let's discuss this rule. Absolutely. But in the meantime, let's follow the rule until we can sort it out or get something different on the books. Correct. In the meantime, let's say what any of us wants it to say, to suit our best interests. Mm. Uh, even if it's an injustice to Nigerian. Okay. And so that's one big issue. That's one large injustice. The other injustice was the way they held this hearing. Uh, I called it a hearing. The city attorney said, oh, no, it's not a hearing. Well, uh, when you are depriving someone of their otherwise granted right, in this case, it's not asserting that unwritten policy that we talked about. Yep. It's asserting the law of the city of Glendale, right. that the longest experienced uh, council member shall be mayor. He says, well, you know, that's, we're just going to take a vote on it. It's like, well, I'm certainly entitled to, uh, to address this issue. Well, you can only speak for 10 minutes. The city council, and I'm going to ask this question uh, next Tuesday, mm -hmm. next city council meeting. Has the council ever restricted speaking time for a council member on a subject? The answer in my 20 years has been no. Mm. We have never restricted speaking time. The only time we've restricted speaking is if we're taking a right away from someone and we're holding a hearing, yep. such as a variance, such as a design issue, such as a development issue, such as a disciplinary issue. But they insisted, they, meaning the city attorney, insisted that I be limited in my ability to speak, that I be limited in having legal counsel explain the, any uh, pertinent legal issues, expanding on the violation of constitutional rights, the city attorney even stopped the city manager from answering a question that I posed to him. This has never been done. It's a complete violation of my rights in doing so. But they just went through, listened to the city attorney. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to they didn't want to take any issue with his advice. They knew how they were going to vote. There's nothing I could have said uh -huh. to that panel of judges, and I'm calling them judges because they're sitting in a quasi-judicial capacity. Quasi-judicial means uh, almost like judges because they're deciding whether a right that I have mm -hmm. is going to be taken away from me or not and whether I'm going to be labeled not in the best interests of the city of Glendale. When you said they, they already knew how they were going to vote... Uh, did this matter come up? Shouldn't a matter of how the city council is going to vote have public debate so everybody hears what they're saying and everything is on the record? Yes. And as as uh, fact finders, uh -huh. they should have had an open mind before the hearing uh, was concluded. I mean, are you sure they knew what they were going to do beforehand? I mean, how do you know that it was staged? 
I mean, maybe this is just all spontaneous. Well, I don't think so. And those were some of the questions I was going to ask the city uh -huh. manager, who, had he answered, would have said, Artie Kasakian has had his mind made up for a month mm -hmm. that you're not going to be mayor. Ellen Asaturian has had her mind up even longer than that, that you're not going to be mayor. And Dan Brotman also had his mind made up at least several weeks prior that you're not going to be mayor. Imagine, ladies and gentlemen, you're coming before the Glendale City Council to determine a right that you have, whether it's a property right or a liberty right, an employment right, and the council has had their mind made up for weeks. Is that fair? Is that justice? Is that constitutional? Is that due process? It's not, it's not, and it's not. But they went through and, and did what they had to do to, to, to pass me over. Mm -hmm. And Ellen's mother and father were there in the audience when I've never seen them at a city council meeting. It's almost as if they knew that their daughter was going to be installed as mayor that very night and that the rules were going to be changed. It's almost as if they knew. Absolutely. It, they knew. Mm. They don't show up. You don't show up to a council meeting uh, with flowers uh, to support your daughter to be the next mayor. You don't show up. Friends don't show up with flowers to give to you if there's a question about whether you're going to be mayor or not. You don't prepare an acceptance speech if, if you're not sure you're going to be mayor mm -hmm. or not. All that was done. All that is injustice. All that is unfair. And it's not just me. You know, if, if folks don't understand all this context, it's not like saying, oh, Najarian's just upset that he wasn't selected mayor. Crybaby. No, that's not what it was. It was a law in the city of Glendale that said, I shall be mayor. And these guys jumped over every, every uh, process known to fair justice to pass me over and select Ellen. I mean, it's almost as if they prepared to subvert all of the rules they prepared before, and almost as if it was a coup, you could call it. I called it a coup. Um, I mean, let's, let's talk about what happened. It was, a, uh, it was an agreement ahead of time. A corrupt bargain. To cor a corrupt bargain to commit an improper act. Some people call that a conspiracy. Now, in the bigger picture, Alex, um, I feel sorry for the people of Glendale, the business owners, the landowners, the employees. If they can do this to me, perhaps one of the most outspoken, uh, legally trained uh, council members that we've had on the dais for at least two decades, what are they going to do to the average Joe Q public. Well, they've, they, they, they've done it, right? So recently there was the noise ordinance that was relaxed. Go. A noise ordinance that was relaxed uh, that was going to benefit those individuals, property owners, property developers, who had contributed financially to the campaigns of Ellen Asaturian, Artie Kasakian, uh, even pay him consulting fees. And this is nothing that is fabricated. This is all disclosed openly. All it takes is a simple search online um, for people to see the dots, let alone connect them. Um, so I have a feeling that this kind of chicanery hasn't, isn't something new. It's been well, going on. It's, it's really picking up speed since uh, 2022. Mm. Let me tell you that. Um, even the city attorney, when presented with these uh, with these facts, uh, was reluctant and and denied uh, the request to speak to the council members involved to caution them that what they're doing, even if it's not against the written letter of Glendale law, certainly gives the impression of impropriety. Now. Is the city attorney an elected or an appointed position? The uh, city attorney is appointed by the city council. Mm. So if three out of the five city council members don't like you, don't like what you've done, um, then they can fire you. 
Right. Okay. And so, if they like what you've done, they can extend your contract. Got it. And by the way, guess whose contract is up for extension on uh, Tuesday? The city attorney's. Absolutely. Got it. Can you believe that? And my request to the city attorney to recuse himself mm -hmm. at the beginning of the hearing was poo-pooed. Oh, I don't have a conflict of interest, Mr. Najarian. No, no. What's going to be run the way I want it to run? Right, Ellen? Right, Artie? Right, Dan? Um, and that is deeply disturbing to me uh, that such a thing happened. So... Uh, we're, you know, back to your original question. Mm -hmm. I've had it up to here with the injustice going on at Glendale City Hall. No one else wants to speak about it. I seem to be the one who is maybe, you know, trying to rock the boat to bring this out to the public's attention. But the public should be outraged. They should be outraged at what's going on because it's simply uh, against our principles, our morals our state laws, and our U.S. constitutional mm -hmm. laws. I will, I mean, you are, have been very politically involved. Um, I mean, you've also been not only involved with city council, but also with the um, L.A. Metro Board, right? Um, you've done a run for um, board, L.A. County Board of Supervisors, yes. correct? Me, personally, prior to this election cycle, I was politically aware, but not politically engaged. Um, what initially drove you to be politically engaged, and how are things different now compared to when you started? Well, let me tell you, uh, Alex, uh, I don't see myself as a shooting star. I know some people do. Ellen sees herself as a shooting star. Um, I started... They, they, they eventually burn out, by the way. Well, <laughs> yes, I've heard that. You know, I started out at the very lowest level. I started... Uh, I became an attorney. I uh, volunteered on a city commission, transportation mm -hmm. commission. Uh, I volunteered in the Superior Court as a, a volunteer judge, Judge Pro Tem. I was a settlement officer. I, uh, I ran for the... Glendale Community College Board of Trustees. Uh, afterwards, I ran for city council. Mm -hmm. Then I joined um, the L.A. Metro Board. I was elected to L.A. Metro. I was uh, selected to Metro Link. Uh, I've done many, you know, many things, but it's always been a very slow progression. So, of course, I was always interested mm -hmm. in politics, in trying to do the right thing in everything I do. Uh, and step by step, a very gradual progression, uh, I, I have uh, gotten to where I am today. And I think that's the only way it should be done. You know, be wary of shooting stars uh -huh. because they will step all over you. They will give you false and, um, you know, uh, condescending reasons as to why they should be taken to the next level. Uh, disingenuous reasons. Uh, that's not what you want. You want someone who's committed and who's dedicated to do the right thing. I'm an attorney. And I tell you, I'm, I'm working 20 to 30 hours a week on my community service. Mm -hmm. And any attorney that hears that says, there's no way. How can you even stay in practice? You know, I put 50 hours in only to law, and that's how I succeed. Well, I've put financial success on the back burner uh, because I think being involved in the community is such an important thing to do. Uh, fortunately, uh, I had the flexibility in my schedule to do so. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that's what we, what we need from our elected officials. Um, so speaking of elected officials, Alan likes to say, oh, I'm the first Armenian uh, woman, immigrant, again, she cannot define what woman is. So I can name, I, I, as, as far as women mayors, uh, Paula Devine and Laura Friedman. I'm trying to think if there's another one that I'm forgetting before Laura Friedman. Uh, there were before, um, there were, I think, two other women before in the 50s. But what, So what I'm saying is the, the ones that you've served with, so Paula Devine and Laura Friedman. Yes. 
Um, let's. How were they? How did you like working with them? What things did you get loggerheads on? Kind of a compare and contrast. Yeah. Um, with you know Ellen now being mayor. So um, I didn't see eye to eye on a lot of things with Laura. She was definitely on the more progressive end. Mm -hmm. uh, however, we uh, we worked professionally. Even back then in 2016, progressive. Oh yes. Okay. Oh, yes. Actually, sorry, but before then, I guess, right? Yes, so 2016 is when she left, 2009. She was elected in, yeah, 2009. Okay. Uh, 2009. Um, Paula is, uh, although she is, I believe, a Democrat, uh, she left that Democrat playbook, you know, on her bedstand and didn't uh -huh. bring it into, into City Hall. And she would do what she knew was right for the city. Uh -huh. uh, she had an open mind on decisions that she made. She was a very good listener to take input from all uh, corners of the city. Uh, and I worked very well with, with Paula. Mm. Um, yeah, she is, you know, Paula voted for you for mayor. I say voted for you. There didn't need to be a vote. Right. Right. The, the ordinance was clearly there, but in the decision to try to bypass that ordinance, she voted in, to, you know, in your favor. But she said something. She said, I'm not against a woman being mayor. It just has to be the right woman. Um, so going back, though, which, you know, back even in 2009, even before the word progressive kind of was a thing, um, what sorts of progressive laws did or uh, votes did Laura Friedman do for Glendale um, even back then? Well, she was very much interested in uh, – she was a bicyclist. Mm-hmm. So she was supportive of uh, roadway redesigns, which uh, took away uh, vehicle travel lanes okay. and gave uh, bike lanes. She was supportive of uh, a lot of the bike infrastructure. We didn't have EVs back then uh, to the extent we have now. I think she was very much interested in creating the, uh, the, the dense... Uh, downtown environment what do they call it now the 15 minute city i'm not even sure what that term is but but have a lot of concentrated development mm -hmm. i disagreed with her most often on the high-rise buildings that you now see that have been completed in downtown glendale those large apartment complexes monstrosities with, yeah with the 500 plus units she was very much in favor of that. So the 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 fifteen minute city moniker is predicated upon you being able to do everything that you need within a fifteen minute radius. Uh, me, I've grown up here in Glendale, driving down Brand Boulevard or Central Boulevard from Mountain Avenue down towards uh, Glendale Memorial, where I work. That takes me twenty minutes now. So this is not a fifteen minute city. That, right. it that, works vision, it. that vision has not been realized. All it has done is create more congestion. Right. Um, and then also tell me this because I, I just noticed this on the road. To Brand Boulevard right over here. So two lanes in either way. Now it's only one lane in either way because there's a protected bike lane. Yes. And, and parking. I had no clue that was going in. Nobody had any clue that was going in. But apparently it was voted on. So can you please tell us the story when that happened? Because uh, messaging has been absent from the city. So there was. Uh, so what you're seeing on Brand Boulevard, north of Glen Oaks, for about a half mile, is a road diet in which two travel lanes, and, and that's a very wide section of our uh, street. Back uh, where there used to be a, a trolley yes, going down there was a to trolley. downtown. Yes. Exactly. Uh, so two travel lanes have been uh, reduced to one travel lane, mm -hmm. and there's a bike lane uh, towards the curb. If not directly at the curb lane, then perhaps a little bit out, depending how the parking configuration yep. is. This is something that was put together by the um, – there was a, a bicycle uh, a mobility plan. That's not the right name for it, but a bicycle and pedestrian – uh, maybe mobility plan for the nine bicyclists in Glendale. Right. And all those nine bicyclists were on the committee. Yep. And they identified that as a location where it would make great sense to put a protected bike lane. Uh, where does it lead to? I'm not sure. 
Uh, how do you get there? I'm not sure, but in that four block uh, distance, we've, we're going to have protected uh, bike lanes. Uh, but there's more. There's more, Alec. This you... is this is one they were able to start on. Okay. They're going to be doing La Crescenta Avenue, which is uh, towards the northern part, mm -hmm. uh, adjacent to Oakmont Country Club. It's a four-lane road currently. Yeah. And they are also doing a road diet there, reducing it to one lane in each direction for vehicles and a, a bike lane on each side. Um, I'm convinced that uh, there will be a lot of public outcry when that actually gets marked up. They tried it, however, and this is where being involved in the city uh, longer than you know four years or five years really pays its dividends. They tried that exact same thing on uh, Verdugo Road okay. uh, from the college all the way up to Oakmont. Yes. Not Kenyatta, but Verdugo is the one that has a few little turns yes. in it. And they tried the same thing, reduced two lanes uh -huh. of travel in each direction to one lane. Yes. And the residents, when they saw what was happening, were extremely uh, vocal yep. in that it be removed. And it was removed in about a week's time. Okay. Uh, and I've never seen such a U-turn be done on public policy in such a short period of time as I saw when uh, they took away those bike lanes again and made it two lanes in each direction. I predict the same thing is going to happen okay. to Brand, North yep. Brand, uh, but definitely on La Crescenta Avenue. Um, people are going to say... We just don't have enough bicyclists here that use it. Right. If there were, we're logical people. We'll give them room to bike safely. Yep. But there just aren't. So t tell me, though, how did this slip under our attention, our being th the Glendale residents? Well. The ones who aren't like the Karen Quacks who sit, yeah. you know, or the, or the um, who sit there every single council meeting, or the Mike Mohills who are there every single meeting. How did that get under our noses? Well, you know, the nature of our system is such that unless you're there sitting in on those council meetings or reviewing each council meeting, um, in fact, reviewing it after the fact won't help. Unless you're there in person yeah. and looking perhaps at a future agenda as to what's coming up, it's going to get snuck by you. You're not going to realize what's happening. The city may do some very minor outreach to a, a small radius of homes, but the average person that's going to be using that doesn't live, you know, within that small radius. Yep. They're traveling, you know, from North Glendale to South Glendale. Yep. And they're not going to know what's happening, and it's going to be tough luck for you uh, if you don't like it. So then explain to me what's going to, so let's say there's not, not let's say, we're losing. We've already lost on the northbound side one lane of traffic. I just know, witnessed that this morning. Yes. And then the south side is probably going to go at some point in the next week or two. Yes. What kind of action vote from the city council is it going to take? Is it going to be like an act of Congress where there are multiple steps? Or what kind of process do we, the citizens, have to go through if we want that to be reversed? Well, you, um, you have to show up. Mm -hmm. First, that's the very most. That's the most effective way is to come to a city council meeting, okay, and state that you see what's going on and you're not happy with it, okay. Uh, the second best is to call in. Yep. The third is to write an, a letter, email, etc., and bring a sufficient number of people so you're not dismissed as being some car nut, some uh, caveman yep. who isn't willing to uh, embrace new uh, planning uh, principles okay. uh, in the roadway system. And then if council were to see enough objection to that, uh, council can take a vote and overturn their decision. You need three votes. And then how much do you, can you tell me how much money this project costs to, to do these new uh, bike lanes? Uh, I don't have it off the top of my head. Uh, is it going to cost in the millions, for yes, example? Yes. So the one on, on North Glendale, they're going to be doing a complete repaving. And in the repaving process, they're going to be placing um, physical barriers. On La Crescenta Avenue. On La Crescenta Avenue. That's going to be, I think the additional cost for that is going to be close to a million dollars. Okay. 
and then to undo it, it's going to be the same. Well, probably, probably so more. because okay. you're going to have the crews out there, uh, you know, removing a lot of man hours yep. involved and restriping and perhaps repaving any divots that were created in the roadway surface. Yeah, it's that's what it's going to be. How long ago were these votes done? These votes, I believe, were done within the last six months. Okay. Last six months to a year. So then if we had more conservative slash less progressive members, um, this would have been voted down or you know can be overturned? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Understood. Um, I believe I was a strong opponent to the La Crescenta Avenue. Mm-hmm. And I warned them that this is going to be a huge issue once it starts being mocked up as to where the lanes are going to be. Yep. Uh, you're going to get a huge public outcry. They didn't care. I'm a caveman, I guess, to, to many of them. Well, and so we're going to explain this next process to people because it's, it's generated a lot of buzz. Um, there is now a movement, a, a formal movement now. Uh, to evict Ellen, to recall yes. Ellen. Um, and so I wanted to take this time to explain the process so that people at home know what exactly will be required of them in order to bring this to fruition. Um, so right now there is to serve Mayor Asaturian with a motion uh, that we're going to do this uh, requires first 500 signatures. And from what I understand, uh, many people have come through, um, so the initial 500 signatures will easily be gotten. Step two is getting 11,000 signatures, so 10% of the electorate. And then if that happens within timely fashion, then in November, it can be put up to the Glendale voters, along with the presidential election, about whether to evict Ellen. Right. Um, if that goes through, can you tell us what would happen? So if that goes through, she must vacate her seat. Yes, if that is a successful recall, uh -huh. it's on the ballot, and fifty plus fifty percent plus one vote to recall, she will lose her seat. Now, the thing that I don't know, and someone asked me this the other day, and I said I'm not quite sure how it works. Would there be a um, a concurrent election mm -hmm. as to who would fill that seat? Uh, that remains to be seen. I think the city council has the... Yes. We, we, we looked it up. So it, it appears as if the remaining members must choose someone to fill in. I think it's similar to when uh, Zare Sinanian um, left his seat. Yes. Um, and then I think the remaining four council members chose uh, uh, Frank Quintero. That's correct. Yes. And then afterwards, there was a special election to fill yes. that seat for him. And I believe it was Dan Brotman who might have won that election. I'm not sure. Uh, that was uh, that was synchronized with the next city council election. Ah, okay. So instead of having two electing two candidates, Understood. you elected two to a full four-year term. Okay. And the third place candidate received a two-year term. Got it. And that's when Dan Brotman got in got it. Uh, at that time. Okay. So it was just, it was timed. Yeah. It looks as if, though, if, for example, she is unseated in 2024, and I think she would be the first Glendale City Council member to be recalled if that is done successfully. Um, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm asking you as if you're the town historian. Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> I do believe um, that I read that the entire city council was once recalled. Whoa. For the egregious action of putting parking meters on Bram Boulevard. <laughs> and this is back in the 40s, I, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Uh -huh. But obviously that was quite, uh, you know, not well taken by the, the public. And there was a recall that, that went on at that time. Funny how people even back in the 40s didn't like being taxed by their right, government. Right. Funny that. Exactly. <laughs> exactly so. Um, so yeah, I just, I, I think it's very important though. And we, again, I, and as, as you know, James and I both, you know, being novices and, and running for office have asked you how things work and, and how to run for office. So if I could have you impart some advice, helpful information for somebody who is genuinely aware of politics, aware of things that are going on, 
wants to make a change and has all this energy, but that just needs to be focused in a direction, what advice would you give to that person as far as focusing that energy and, and getting into what you've gotten into? Well, uh, so I have a couple, couple points. Um, the first is, uh, if you, you know, take a page out of my playbook, start early and start at a level uh, where you can get the um, get a good feel for the city of Glendale. Mm-hmm. Don't just you know without any w- without any uh, previous uh, involvement in the community. Don't run for you know state senate. Okay, you really need to have some background going. <laughs> is is that a backhanded swipe at me of making my first race a race for Congress? <laughs> no. <laughs> Se- secondly, know where your values are. Yeah. Do you have values or is all you want to do is get elected and you'll figure out the values stuff later? It's too often these elected officials, all they want to do is get elected and they'll fill in the blank as to what their values are and their principles are yeah. uh, at a later date. You have to run on your values and your principles. People are going to appreciate that. If you had started at a lower level, <laughs> I think it'd be easier. Your your run for any elected official, uh-huh. any race is easier just because people know you, you've got a certain sense of things. I'm not saying don't, you know, if you're compassionate and passionate to go for that seat, I mean, I got to hand it to you. Running for Congress is a is a big is a big commitment of time and exposure and you leave yourself open to all sorts of national you know glendale is bad enough right yeah now you're now you're dealing with national issues national uh support national opposition um but get your principles down uh be rooted in the community and then run and do your damnedest and if you don't make it try again and try again so, yes, do you have any other um, thoughts on your mind, anything else that you want to talk about? Yeah, I do. You know, so we talked about what helps to uh, advance and to get involved in politics as an elected. Yep. You don't have to be an elected to make a difference in this community. Your voice, uh, if you feel strongly about an issue, should be heard at the city council or the appropriate forum and you should bring people with you because you really do have an impact uh, if you're there with a group or if you're there continuously stating your case, stating your positions. That does have an impact. Don't now, think it's not going to affect anyone. Well, I have a question about that because if there is a certain uh, topic, for example, on the agenda, you're going to discuss, let's say, the bicycle lanes then people can speak during that time. But there's also an open comment section where you can say, let's say if the bicycle lane was not on the agenda and you're going to say the bicycle lanes are in, I hate them, this is why I hate them. That used to be at the beginning of the city council meeting. Is that correct? Yes. And now, however, it's at the end. And I've been to some of those where you're going to say something that's not on the agenda and you're waiting. I mean, you guys are there until 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock sometimes. And so people who need to talk about those things must be there also at that time and just wait through the entire time. Um, When did that change occur? Why is that change there? And how do you feel? Where do you feel that that open comment section should be for the average citizen? Well, um, it started when Dan Brotman became mayor. So a couple of years ago. uh, Yeah, a year ago. He pushed all the public comment, the general public comment, to the end of the meeting. Why was that? Well, some people have said he wants to discourage public comment. Okay. Uh, At a long meeting, uh, many people drop out. They say, oh, I got to go home. I agree. 1030, it's 11, I got work tomorrow, I got to get the kids ready, and they drop out. When I was mayor, the times that I've been mayor... Uh, I've offered a choice for a shorter period at the front of the meeting, okay. typically three minutes. If uh-huh. you want to speak for three minutes, we'll give it to you up front. Okay. But if you want your full five, we're going to ask that you stay till the end. Okay. Uh, and I think that was well received. It was uh, a nice blend of the timing and the length of time that you could speak. Yep. Uh, 
if I were ever to have been mayor again, I don't know if that'll ever happen. Uh, I think that's the best way to do it. Mm-hmm. Is a short period up front, if you absolutely positively have to do it and get home by seven or eight. Uh-huh. But if you want your length of time to orate, uh, it'll be at the end of the meeting. And is that d- does it have to go up to the entire council's vote, or is that something where Dan Brotman says, I am king for a year, <laughs> and I'm going to go ahead and make that change? And that is something uh, at the discretion of the mayor. At the discretion of the mayor. Right. Okay. So if if, um, if Ellen wants to change it so that there's three minutes at the beginning, she can do that. Yes. Okay. She certainly can do that. I see. Um, oh, that's actually what was going to be my next question because if she's evicted, so to speak, in the middle of her mayoral term, who becomes mayor then? Would it still be the longest serving person who has not uh, been mayor? I believe it. <coughs> Excuse me. I believe it would be. Interesting. Okay. Um, well, and I... would they invoke the best interest clause again uh, to skip over the, you know, longest serving uh-huh. council member who had not been mayor, blah, blah, blah. And, and then that would make Artie the mayor again, I believe. Because um, he would be next in line. Yes. Not having been mayor. Because it couldn't be Dan and it couldn't be Vartan. Right. So we have a rule that says in the last year of your term, Uh you cannot be mayor. So as it currently stands... Because you'd be running for re-election. Right. And you'd have the unfair advantage. Right. Okay. So as it currently stands, Artie is lined up to be the mayor uh, next year if we don't invoke the best interest clause against him at that point. Because you would be up for re-election is what it is. Because I would be up for re-election. Understood. Exactly. But is that part of the ordinance? Yes. It is part of the ordinance. Understood. Which I, which I was willing to look at and perhaps change mm-hmm. in such a manner that I would be mayor this year and Ellen would be mayor next year. And although that would have been Ellen's fourth year? Yes. So then she, if she was running for re-election, she could not have been mayor. Uh, but we were good. That's what we were going to. That's the way it is now. Yeah. But I was willing to look at that. Yeah. And give her that uh, opportunity, basically mm-hmm. give her a great opportunity to number one. She wanted to be mayor in her first four years. Yep. Check that box. OK. And now she gets to be mayor while she's running for reelection. Mm-hmm. Double check. And so on, on the flip side of that, though, um, Paula Devine correctly, in my opinion, stated that. If you cannot, you know, you cannot run, you cannot be mayor in your fourth year if you're running for re-election. She says that is your choice. Because if Ellen so badly wanted to be mayor, she could say, okay, I will be mayor my fourth year. I'm not going to run for re-election. I'll run maybe in two years when a seat opens. Or what Ellen could have done is hustle, run for re-election. And then if she wins, the first year of her second term, would she would she become would be mayor. mayor. Absolutely. Yeah. And so... I completely agree with what Paula said. Hustle. Show that you are electable. Show that people like you and will get behind you so that they sure. are proud to have you as your mayor. Right. Not as we are all now, right. angry, regretful, yes. ashamed that she is our illegitimate mayor. Yeah, absolutely. Um. I think there's been a lot of damage done to the city uh, by this cute attempt to skip over the law and violate the law. And we have to see, it's not over. I mean, things are just getting started. And so I think there's going to be a lot of uh, political unrest uh, until this somehow gets straightened out. And and again, as a, as a lay person, as a voter, me, you know, somebody who's not on council, somebody who, can cast a vote. Objectively speaking, I don't understand how she can view this as something advantageous to her, something that's going to boost her popularity, boost her brand. Um, I mean, on the street, the average person on the street sees this as a very huge compromise of principles. Um, And I, I think she has sealed her own fate because more people than not see just how tainted 
her thinking process is. Uh, I agree with you, Alex. I believe it was a huge miscalculation uh, on her part, on Artie's part, on Dan Brotman's part. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they thought maybe the the uh, residents were sheep and they weren't going to notice what was happening or that they thought I was just going to go away quietly and sit in the corner. Uh, it's a huge miscalculation that we'll have to see uh, in the end what sort of effects it's going to have on them. I mean, it, it, it might just be like the Challenger disaster. <laughs> just go, 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 and then the O-ring just pops and there it goes. So yeah. that, that, that'll, be Ellen's, that'll be Ellen's candidacy in her political career yeah. in, in one analogy. Could be. <laughs> Um, anything else on your mind that you'd like people at home to know? Uh, that's it for now, Alex. You okay. know, there's always stuff popping up, but for now, <laughs> for now, this is, this is where we are. I am filing a lawsuit against the city, okay. uh, for violating my rights. Okay. Uh, that will be heard by a superior court judge. Mm-hmm. Uh, the timing has not been determined yet. All right. And, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, a impartial judicial officer can, uh, spank everyone on the wrist and say what you folks did was just wrong. Uh-huh. Do it the right way this time. Okay. Um, and but we we would still continue with our recall efforts. Yes, of is, course, is what we would do. Yeah, because... that doesn't that doesn't solve the recall. Yep. So my efforts are the lawsuit. I yep. think the populace are going for the recall. Yes. And I don't know what other you know factors or components of the city there are that are. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. work being done uh separate from a recall yep. you know a public recall uh but we'll see we'll see what happens stay tuned <laughs> we we definitely will thank you ara thank you for thank uh, you, Alex. coming to visit us uh that has been another episode of enough talk thank you for joining us uh please tell your friends your enemies and your frenemies um like us on facebook uh like us on youtube and uh we'll see you next time <laughs>